Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. Um, we're going to have two senators ask questions and then break for lunch somewhere around an hour from now. Senators Cornyn and White House will be recognized in succession. First, Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge, I want, want you to do me a favor. Um, will you nerd out with me a little bit? Uh, um, I will try, Senator. And we'll, we'll start with stare decisis. Yes. And I've never figured out why lawyers speak in Latin rather than in English uh, when describing these concepts by which judges apply precedent. But would you agree with me that um, even under an appropriate stare decisis uh, analysis that Dred Scott and Plessy versus Ferguson were appropriately overruled by the Supreme Court? Well, Senator, um, I've not engaged in the actual analysis, but I think it is well established now um, that the cases um, that overruled uh, Dred Scott and Plessy were um, correctly decided. Yeah, I mean, there, there is the, a means by which the courts can correct their mistakes, correct, by overruling uh, previous decisions? If the various considerations that the Supreme Court has uh, uses to make that determination and are have satisfied. You, have you ever heard a federal judge talk about super-duper president or super precedent? I have not. I've never seen it either in any opinion. I've heard it here in the uh, Judiciary Committee on a number of occasions when somebody has a favorite case or outcome that they don't want to see the Supreme Court revisit. Um, let me ask a minute. Obviously, your uh, nomination by President Biden is historic, and I congratulate you again, congratulated you previously, and I think it's uh, been long overdue. When Clarence Thomas, the second African-American who was uh, nominated to and confirmed by the Supreme Court, was nominated to the court, did you celebrate that as a historic event? I'm trying to remember where I was at the time. I believe I did, yes. When we're talking about staying in your lane, uh, and I appreciate your responses to a number of the questions, even though I'd love to get your answer to the question, but where you've deferred answering, saying you want to stay in your lane and not be uh, seen as a policymaker, uh, would you agree with me that one of the most important questions under our constitutional form of government and the separation of powers is who decides? In other words, some questions are appropriately decided by judges who are elected, or unelected, excuse me, serve for life, insulated from politics, and other decisions are appropriately within the, um, left up to the legislative branch because they are, we are accountable to the people who can vote for us, they can vote against us, um, if they don't like the policies that we, uh, that we enact in legislation. Would you agree with that who decides is an important question in terms of determining the appropriate role for both the judiciary and the uh, legislature? As a general matter, I agree. It rarely comes directly like that as an issue. It's, it's, it's usually not a jump ball between, <laughs> um, between I, the I, legislature and the executive. I get it. Branch. You don't get a lot of easy, easy questions. Well, um, but well, you, as a general proposition, you won't uh, disagree with me. What I'd say is that the courts are properly tasked with resolving legal Questions and that, cases or controversies, well, right? Exactly, in right. every case, and Congress is not similarly constrained. We can pass broad policies, comprehensive legislation, changing policy. But the difference is one of the differences is the voters can unelect us if they don't like what we're doing. That is true. I want to ask you: What did you study under Lawrence Tribe when you were at Harvard? I did not. Well. As you know, Justice Breyer, your mentor, 
wrote a little book called Active Liberty. And um, Lawrence Tribe, who uh, was a formerly a law professor at Harvard, wrote a review of that book in the New York Times Review of Books. And the title of it is Politicians in Robes. Are you familiar with that article? I am not. Well, in the article, Professor Tribe accuses Justice Breyer of engaging in what he calls a noble lie. And he said, he talks about the morality of resorting to falsehoods and delusions to conceal, usually from the masses, but sometimes from oneself, the truths whose revelation would wreak havoc or at least do more harm than good. Professor Tribe goes on in criticizing Justice Breyer's book. He says, in his stubborn, stubborn av avowal that the court, even with its current far-right supermajority, remains an apolitical body, he perpetuates a lie that is anything but noble. You've talked about staying in your lane, not making policy decisions, not being seen as political. Do you agree with Justice Breyer that, or with Professor Tribe? Senator, um, I believe that judges are not policymakers, that um, we have a constitutional duty to decide only cases and controversies that are presented before us, and within that framework, uh, judges exercise their authority to interpret the law and not make the law. So you would, you would agree with me that judges should not be politicians? Yes. Let me talk to you a little bit about some of the decisions that have been made by the Supreme Court over many years, starting perhaps with Dred, Dred Scott, that adopts the substantive due process argument to determine the constitutionality of, um, of various laws. Perhaps the most recent decision by the Supreme Court that was a dramatic departure from, uh, from previous laws in the states and in the nation was the Oberfell case, which um, dealt with same-sex marriage. In the opinions that were written there, it was noted that here we are 200, at the time, 234 years after the Constitution had been ratified, 135 years since the 14th Amendment had been ratified, that the Supreme Court articulated a, a new fundamental right, which is a right to same-sex marriage. You're familiar with that case, aren't you? I am. At the time, it was noted that 11 states, including the District of Columbia, had, had passed laws sanctioning same-sex marriage. But also at the same time, there were 35 states who put it on the ballot, and 32 of those states decided to maintain the traditional definition of marriage between a man and a woman. Do you agree with me that uh, marriage is not simply a governmental institution, it's also a religious institution? Well, Senator, um, marriages are often performed in re religious institutions. Well, when the, when the, you agree with me that many of the, the major religions that I can think of, and they're Christianity, Judaism, Islam, embrace a traditional definition of marriage, correct? I am aware that there are various religious faiths that define marriage in a traditional way. Do you, um, do you see that when the Supreme Court makes a dramatic pronouncement about the invalidity of state marriage laws, that it will inevitably set in conflict um, between 
those who ascribe to the Supreme Court's edict and those who have a firmly held religious belief that marriage is between a man and a woman? Well, Senator, I, I, these issues are being litigated, as you know, throughout the courts as people um, raise issues. And so it's, I'm limited in what I, I can say about them. I'm aware that there are cases. Um, no, I'm not asking you to decide a case or predict how you would decide in the future. I'm just asking, isn't it apparent that when the Supreme Court decides that something that is not even in the Constitution is a fundamental right and no state can pass any law that conflicts with the Supreme Court's edict, particularly in an area where people have sincerely held religious beliefs, doesn't that necessarily create a conflict between what people may believe is a matter of their religious doctrine or faith and what the federal government says is the law of the land? Well, Senator, that is the nature of a right, that um, when there is a right, um, it means that there are limitations on regulation, even if uh, people are regulating pursuant to their sincerely held religious beliefs. Do you agree with marriage is not mentioned in the Constitution, is it? It is not mentioned directly, no. And um, religious freedom and um, is mentioned in the First Amendment explicitly, correct? It is. Do you share my concern that when the court takes on the role of identifying an unenumerated right, in other words, it's not mentioned in the Constitution, and creates a new right, declaring that anything conflicting with that is unconstitutional, that it creates a circumstance where those who may hold traditional beliefs, like something as important as marriage, uh, that they will be um, vilified as unwilling to assent to this new orthodoxy? So, Senator, I understand that concern. And because there are cases that are addressing these sorts of issues, I'm not in a position to comment about either my personal views or whether I'm not ask, and I'm not asking you to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Justice Alito in the uh, in the Oberfeld case wrote. He said, "I assume those who cling to the old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes, but if they repeat those views in public." they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by government, employers, and schools. So the Oberfeld case, we, to nerd out with you again, was, um, was decided under a doctrine known as substantive due process, correct? If memory serves, I, um, yes, substantive due process, and I think there might have been equal protection concerns and the, and the well. court, the Supreme Court has uh, applied that somehow mis fairly mysteriously by saying it's created by the confluence of the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment to the United States Constitution. But historically, it's been applied in ways that uh, seem to sanction explicit policymaking by the courts. For example, the, the Lochner versus New York case, which I know you talked to Senator Lee about in particular, which it was a New Deal case which set limitations on how long bakers could work in New York. The Supreme Court struck that down and said it violated the right of free contract. Now, Lochner, as you know, was overruled 30-something years later, but it's also been applied in a number of different circumstances. For example, um, it's been suggested that Dred Scott, which treated slaves as chattel property, was a product of substantive due process. Justice Hugo Black has criticized the uh, doctrine of substantive due process 
as the arbitrary fiat of the man or men in power, or the court declaring a law invalid because it shocked the consciences of at least five members of the court. He went on to say this use of judicial review thus subverts the liberty of government by the people overturning laws en enacted by legislators, legislatures who are answerable to the electorate rather than a majority of the Supreme Court. Finally, he said, finally for the purpose of my question, he said the adoption of such a loose, flexible, uncontrolled standard for holding laws unconstitutional, if ever it is finally achieved, will amount to a great unconstitutional shift of power to the courts, which I believe, Justice Black that is, and am constrained to say will be bad for the courts and worse for the country. Judge Justice Jackson, why isn't substantive due process analysis just another form of judicial policymaking, which you've suggested policymaking is not in your lane, or and you strive to be apolitical, something I, I, I applaud. But why isn't substantive due process just another way for judges to hide their policymaking under the guise of interpreting the Constitution? Well, Senator, the justices have interpreted the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to include a substantive provision, the, the, um, the rights to due process. They have interpreted that to mean not just procedural rights relative to government action, but also the protection of certain uh, personal um, rights related to intimacy and autonomy. They include things like um, the, the right to rear one's children, um, I believe the right to travel, the right to marriage, um, interracial marriage, the right uh, to an abortion, the contraception. These treating uh, treating uh, slaves as chattel property. I'm. I don't quite remember the basis for the Dred, Dred Scott opinion, but but I'll trust you that that. Well, the the fact is, is it not that you can use substantive due process to justify basically any result? Well, the court, whether it's conservative or liberal, libertarian or conservative, whatever you would like to call, it's just a it's a mode of analysis by the court that allows the court to substitute its opinion for the elected representatives of the people. And um, and would you agree? The court has um, identified standards for the determination of rights under the 14th Amendment substantive due process. And who, who gives them the right to, to do that? If it's not mentioned in the Constitution, where does the right of the court to substitute its views for that of the elected representatives of the people? Where does that come from? Well, the court has interpreted the 14th Amendment to include this component, um, the unenumerated right to substantive due process, and the court has said that um, that the kinds of things that qualify are implicit in the concept of order, ordered liber liberty, excuse me, or deeply rooted in our nation's history and tradition. Um, those are standards that identify a narrow set of activities. Well, Judge, judge the, um, in the Oberfeld case, uh, Justice Roberts, in his dissent, noted that the court invalidated marriage laws of more than half the states and orders the transformation of a social institution that has formed the basis for human society for millennia. So that was the basis for the institution of marriage is the practice for millennia and the recognition that marriage was between a man and a woman. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing the merits or lack of merits of same-sex marriage. I believe the states and the, elect and the, and the voters 
can choose what they will, and that's their prerogative, and I think that's legitimate. But when the court overrules the decisions made by the people, as they did in 32 of the 35 states that decided to, to, uh, to, to uh, recognize only traditional marriage between a man and a woman, uh, that is a act of judicial policy making, is it not? Senator, the Supreme Court has considered that to be an application of the substantive due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Right. And it doesn't, the, the Constitution doesn't mention anything about substance when it talks about due process. The four, 14th Amendment and the Fifth Amendment don't talk about substantive due process. It talks about due process of law. Correct? Correct. Well, one of the things that concerns me is here is an example of the courts finding a new fundamental right that is mentioned nowhere in the document of the Constitution that's the product of simply court-made law that we're all supposed to salute smartly and follow because nine people who are unelected, who have lifetime tenure, whose salary cannot be reduced while they serve in office, they, de they decide, five of them decide that this is the way the world should be. What other unenumerated rights do you believe exist? And how could we possibly anticipate what those might be? For example, the Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people, which suggests to me that there are other as yet unidentified rights out there, and somehow, some, someday, some court is going to tell us we've identified an unenumerated right, and we're going to reject the right of the American people to determine what the policies ought to be as regards that right, because we, the nine people sitting on the Supreme Court, have decided we've discovered a new unenumerated right, and it shall be the law of the land, and no legislature can pass any law that conflicts with it. What other unenumerated rights are out there, or can you say? Senator, I can't say. Um, it's a, a hypothetical that I've not, I'm not in a position to comment on. Um, the, the rights that the Supreme Court has recognized as substantive due process rights um, are established in, in, in its case law. But, Your Honor, this is not a trick question. Oh, I understand. Okay. I'm just not, I'm just not in a position to speak to the... Well, can, well, can I, you understand why, why ordinary folks wonder who do these people think they are and where does this authority come from? I yes. think the authority comes from we the people. That's the source of legitimacy of government. But when the courts decide to identify an unenumerated right and negate anything that conflicts with it, can't you see how they might just might feel that this is illegitimate or a uh, sort of policy making that you, that you have uh, disavowed? by saying that you don't want to make policy, you want to stay in your lane. Can you understand the concern? Absolutely, Senator. I do understand it. And how do you, and how, because I believe the court's legitimacy is very important. That's why I agree with Justice Breyer that notwithstanding what anybody else says, that the, that should be an aspirational goal of the judges because we're all concerned about the legitimacy of our institutions. And particularly, I would say, the institution of our judiciary. So how do, how do you as a judge, when you are approaching uh, your decisions, how do you try to avoid being seen as a policymaker by embracing doctrines like substantive due process, which is essentially gives judges carte blanche uh, to do whatever they want? 
Well, Senator, I've not had that particular situation, but I do I have a methodology that is designed to, to avoid my uh, importation of policy perspectives. Um, the judges are constrained in our system. That's part of the constitutional design. And so in all cases, I am looking neutrally at the arguments of the parties, and presumably in a case like this, there would be arguments made on both sides of the issue. Well, uh, Your Honor, if you'll forgive me. Yes. One, one reason um, I think the Supreme Court's different is because in your previous capacity as a trial judge, of course, you were bound by circuit court precedent. And on the circuit court, you're bound by the Supreme Court precedent. But as a member of the United States Supreme Court, you will be bound by nothing. You will be unaccountable to the voters. And so you said you can. Well, respectfully, Senator. I mean, yes. So, so, you, so you're not going to be able to find the answer in some law book somewhere. You're going to be presented with a case, and the argument's going to be made. This is an unenumerated fundamental right. And the voters, whatever they've said, is irrelevant. Because we, five members of the Supreme Court, are going to decide what the law of the land should be. And anybody who disagrees with us will be labeled a bigot or be accused of discrimination. Even if those, their beliefs happen to flow from sincerely held religious conviction, like the definition of a, of a marriage between a man and a woman. But you've already told me that you under, you see why the this is a, a concern. I, I see why it is a concern, and I would just say that although the Supreme Court is not, you know, bound in the sense of having to uh, apply prior precedent, there is stare decisis in our system. There are now standards in the stare decisis world that the Supreme Court well, applies when it when well, it's, it's asked to. Well, um, well, sorry. Th well, thank goodness the Supreme Court has been willing to revisit its precedent or we'd still be living with Plessy versus Ferguson or Dred Scott. You know, one of the things Senator Whitehouse and I agree on is he, he and others frequently ask nominees for the Supreme Court, do you think Brown versus Board of Education has settled law? And believe it or not, some nominees won't answer the question. I mean, it boggles the mind. I tend to think that uh, nominees from both parties tend to be overcoached and not uh, and told you can't be, if you don't answer the question, you have a better chance of being confirmed. But some of these things are obviously settled, and I wish we had a more candid conversation about the, the source of the power that unelected lifetime tenured judges have to basically rule rule America when they decide that something is an un unenumerated fundamental right. Let me, uh, in the minute 48 seconds I have, ask you about a specific case. You remember U.S. versus Brown? Uh, this was a guilty plea and where you were uh, asked to assess a punishment. And it one point in, your, in the proceedings, you said, I'm going to state for the record, however, that this court has a long-standing policy disagreement with the criminal history guidelines with respect to the application of the two-point enhancement. Do you remember when you said that? I don't remember that particular um, statement. How is that policy disagreement different from other disagreements ah. where you said that you're not going to get out of, out of your lane, you're not going to get into the policy lane? Yes. Senator, um, the Supreme Court in the sentencing realm has made the guidelines, the sentencing guidelines, uh, advisory. They used to be mandatory. Judges used to have to calculate the guidelines for sentencing purposes and then essentially apply a sentence within the guideline range. In a case uh, called uh, United States versus Booker, um, the Supreme Court determined that the guidelines were are advisory now, so they don't have to be 
uh, applied in every case. You have to calculate them, but judges have more freedom to give effect to Congress's um, uh, the various provisions in the statute related to sentencing. In Booker and in, the, in its progeny, the Supreme Court made clear that judges at sentencing. Judge, I only have I only have a limited amount of time, so um, let me just close on one other question, and forgive me for interrupting yes. you. But but I, there's such a thing as a judicial filibuster too. Sorry, uh, I was and, getting, uh, <laughs> trying to get to the point. Let me but. just let me just ask. I don't know you well, but I've been impressed by our interaction, and you've been gracious and charming. Why in the world would you call? Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld and George W. Bush war criminals in a legal filing. It seems so out of character for you. Senator, you may have been talk. are you talking about briefs that I, or habeas petitions that talk, I filed? Talking about when you were representing a member of the Taliban and uh, the Department of Defense identified him as an intelligence officer for the Taliban and you referred to the Secretary of Defense and the sitting President of the United States as war criminals. Why would you do something like that? It seems so out of character. Well, Senator, I don't remember that particular reference, and I um, was representing my clients and making arguments. Um, I'd, I'd have to take a look at what you, what you meant. I did not um, intend to disparage the President or the, the Secretary of Defense. Well, war, being a war criminal has uh, huge ramifications. You could be subject to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and hauled before that international tribunal and tried for war crimes. So it's not a casual comment, I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Judge Jackson, good to be with you again. Great to be with you. 